We're going to move on to discussions of energy, specifically conservation of mechanical energy. Uh, we will start with talking about kinetic energy and work. So we're going to start with our definition of kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is one half mass times the magnitude of the velocity squared. We can write this as one half m v dot v. And then we can look, we can take the time derivative of this. How rapidly is the kinetic energy changing? So here um, we can write this. So mass is, we're going to consider cases where the mass is constant. One half, where it basically is in the entire system, as long if you have a closed system. Um, unless you get up to relativistic speeds, but we're not talking about that today. So then this is the derivative operator acting on V dot V. So one half M V dot dotted with V plus V dotted with V dot. So we can write this as m v dot dot v. And this is just the force. So the time derivative of the kinetic energy is the dot product of the force with the velocity. We can then further write the force. This has the force dotted with d r d t. And now you can see we have a dt on both sides, so we can multiply through by dt, and we get d capital T equals f dot d r. Integrate both sides, and we get that the kinetic energy, or the changing kinetic energy, final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy, is equal to F dot dr. So the change in a particle's kinetic energy between two neighboring points on its path is equal to the work done by the net force as it moves between the two points. Now, um, you would have probably seen this already in your introductory uh, in your introductory class. Now this is something that we call a line integral where we have uh, we have to consider the path that we are using to go between two points. So if you follow a funky curve, if you want to calculate the force done, you have to know you have to um, integrate, along this path. And in the cases that we're going to cover in this class, um, either it turns out that the path doesn't matter for something called a conservative force, or it turns out that, or we are only going to consider cases where we can parameterize the shape of this line so that we can calculate this line integral. All right, and then we are going to do a few examples of line integrals. All right, so I have copied over here uh, figure 4.2. Um, we're going to consider three line integrals um, where along paths A, B, and C. So along, we are going from the origin at 0, 0 to point P at 0, or sorry, at 1, 1. And we're either going to go along the x-axis and then the y-axis, that's path A, along the diagonal, that's path B, or along a circular trajectory from point or that goes around point Q. So then we are going to consider the force F equals Y X hat plus two X Y hat. So um, while this is a little more abstract, 
Consider, for instance, if you're pushing a sofa um, along the floor, you can choose three different paths, and the amount of work done can be different along those different paths. Um, so let's first do path A. And here, um, we're going to break this into two segments. Along the, se the first segment, um, we're going to, this is going to be an integral from 0 to 1 along the x-axis, um, but we'll, actually, let's write explicitly f, ah, here I'm going to put in y x hat plus 2 x y hat. And then, and this is my F and my DR along this direction. So R is in, DR is in this direction. So my DR is just X hat DX. And when I do this dot product, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get an integral over x, so all of my vectors go away. So the key here is parameterizing your path in terms of some type of variable, in terms of variables, so that you know, um, so that you know how to do this dot product, f dot dr, um, you do it and then it becomes a one-dimensional integral. Um, and then, ah, and I have to add my second path, which is going to be from over, it's going to be over y, so I'm going to integrate from 0 to 1. My force is the exact same expression. And now my dr has the same form, but it's y hat dy. And then in this integral, y always takes the value of 0 along this path. So I can evaluate y, and that becomes 0. And along this path, x always equals 1. Then when I evaluate this, so I have 2 x y hat dotted with x hat so this entire term is equal to zero i can then consider this part this now this is one so i have y x hat plus two y hat dotted with y hat this term goes to zero but I am left with the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 dy, and this simply gives me 2. So I'm just going to note that down over here. Path A gives me an answer of 2. Now, if we were, um, we are physicists, so if this is all in SI units, this is joules. I can keep track of units here. There would be some constants out in front of these numerical values that make the units work out. This is mostly an exercise just to make sure that we understand how to do the, um, how to do the line integrals. I'm just going to assume the units are joules. Um, but if you were working with a real problem in class that has physical units, it is a good idea to double check your units as you go through to make sure that your units work out correctly. Okay, so then we want to consider path B. Oh, I prefer the bright green marker because you guys can see it really well. Path B. Now here, the dr is a little bit trickier. So we can tell that dr is in the direction of, uh, of 1, 1. So we're going to call it x, x hat plus y, y hat. Ah, no, we're going to call it 
x hat dx plus y hat dy. The problem is that this thing, uh, x hat plus y hat, this has a, a magnitude which is not 1. So when we, um, if we were to do our integral, this is going to change the magnitude of the integral. We need r hat to, uh, we need dr, um, we need these constants to have a uh, magnitude of 1. So we're going to divide by the square root of, or we're going to divide by the magnitude. So the magnitude in this case is the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared, so the square root of 2. So if I have a little unit vector um, in this direction, um, I want to make sure that I have that. Um, I, I could also write this as um, I, I want to write it as, um, I want to write my dr with a unit of 1. All right, so then I do f dot dr, the integral of that, and I get, and this is going to go from this point to that point. I can't plug the numbers in quite yet. Um, here, I've got y x hat plus 2x y hat dotted with x hat dx plus y hat dy over the square root of 2. And then I can plug this in, and I, get, I can pull my square root of 2 out in front. Um, and I am left with y dx plus 2x dy. And here, I'm going to use x equals y. And I'm going to eliminate my y's. That means dx equals dy. So I can write this as the integral, it's now an integral over x of x dx plus 2x dx, which is 3 over the square root of 2 times the integral of x dx from 0 to 1. So this gives me 3 over the square root of 2. This term gives me x squared over 2, evaluated at 1 minus 0, gives me 1 half. And I get 3 over 2 root 2. So I can write that up over here. Half b gives me 3 over 2 root 2 joules. All right, the last one is trickier, and there's a whole bunch of different parameterizations you could use. What really matters is that you use something which works um, and which is going to describe this quarter circle. So um, here, what we're going to do is start well, I'm going to redraw this. And if we want, so we'll draw x, y, and we're shifting coordinates here. So actually, let me not label it just yet. Well, let's, let's start with it labeled, but we'll do, we're going to delete that. Okay, now we have a circle of radius 1, and that is given by the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Um, and I can use polar coordinates. So I have x, in this case, equals the 
radius, which is 1, cosine theta, where this is theta, y equals sine theta, um, and then my quarter circle, as drawn here, would actually run from theta equals pi over 2 to pi. So, so far so good. Now, if I want to shift the coordinates, so I want my circle to be centered at 1, I'm going to rename these so that I can stick with the conventions originally de defined. Rather than calling them x and y, I'm going to call them x prime and y prime. And if I, so now I want x equal to x prime. x prime plus 1, and then y equals y prime, and then here I have x minus 1 squared plus y squared equals 1, so that's going to center the circle at x equals 1, and x equals 1 plus cosine of theta, and y equals sine of theta. And I just want to point out that this is slightly different than the way the book did it. I will also admit that I am flying without a net because I have it in my notes the way I, the book did it, but I wanted to go through it a little bit more explicitly here. So then if we have this as x, dx equals ah, hang on. All right, let me switch back to my favorite marker color. dr d theta. We're going to take the derivative, and the reason we're going to do that is that it leaves us with a nice, neat expression for dr as a function of theta. So dr equals negative sine theta x hat, we're going to multiply by th d theta, or sorry, yeah, the d theta is right there. So negative sine theta, x hat, plus cosine theta, y hat. And you can see that this has a length of 1 because sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So we get that dr equals negative sine theta x hat d theta plus cosine theta y hat d theta. And then we can rewrite our force equals sine theta x hat 
plus 2 cosine theta. Ah, no, I need my full expression of x, which is 2. So I've got a, the 2 comes down. And then I have 1 plus cosine theta y hat. OK, and what differs is that the way your book defined it, you had a, a minus sign. So here you have a 1 minus cosine theta instead of a 1 plus cosine theta. And the integration limits are different. That's because the book chose a slightly different. Uh, it's, I think it started with theta equals 0 there. <clears throat> I chose to line it up with the typical coordinates that we use. All right, and now we can do f dot dr is negative sine squared theta. And we're just going to put the d theta out in front. So that's from this dotted with that plus 2 1 plus cosine theta cos theta all d theta and then our we will integrate and now our integration limits run from pi over 2 to pi and we're going to muck with this integrand a little bit in order to simplify it so that it is easier to work with. So here we have negative sine squared theta plus 2 cosine theta plus 2 cosine squared of theta. And then there's a few ways that you could do this. I'm going to use our half angle formula um, for writing this term and that term in terms of the cosine of 2 theta. So this is negative. Let me just give myself a little bit more space because I think I'm going to need it. So this is a negative 1 half minus 1 half cosine 2 theta plus 2 cosine theta plus the 2 out in front, 2 1 half plus 1 half cosine 2 theta. Now, you might ask, how do I remember the cosine, the, the half angle formula? I sort of always, I always remember it has this form. And then what you don't see when I'm writing stuff on the board is that I'm actually going through in my head and double checking because cosine, of, so sine of 0 has to equal 0. And cosine of 0 is 1. So here I end up with half minus 1 half at theta equals 0. And that gives me the right answer. And then here, I have to end up with cosine squared at 0 equaling 1. So I get half plus 1 half. And that tells me which one is plus a half and which one's minus a half. All right. Then I have a bunch of silly constants that I have to keep track of. My 2 cosine theta just comes along for the ride. And then my constants here, I have 1 minus 1 half, which just leaves me with a plus 1 half. And then here, I have cosine 2 theta minus a minus half of cosine 2 theta. So I end up with three halves, 
cosine two theta. And then I can integrate all of that. What you also don't see is that I'm seeing if I can, I'm trying to double check my work ahead in my head to make sure that I'm not making dumb mistakes. But I probably, I very easily could be. The difference between me and you is not the number of dumb mistakes we make, it's how rapidly we catch them. All right, so two cosine theta plus one half plus three halves cosine two theta integrated over theta from pi over two to pi. So this term, let's see, let's do this step by step. My two cosine theta term gives me to sine theta from zero to pi, or, or sorry, from pi over two, to pi. This term plus one half pi minus pi over two gives me a pi over four. plus here, this gives me a so I'm going to have a sine of 2 theta and here I'm going to work out the constants, squishing stuff a little bit. So when I take the derivative, I get a cosine 2 theta and a factor of 2. So I have a 3 over 4 there to make sure my constants work out. And this term this is zero and that is zero. So this term goes to zero. This term gives me sine of pi, which is, which is zero minus 2 sine of pi over 2 sine of pi over 2 is 1. So this gives me a 2. And here I have, I think I have a sign mistake. All right, so the mistake that I made is that I am going this way around the circle when I go from pi over 2 to pi. So I actually have to switch my integration limits. Here I have, I am going from pi to pi over 2. And then likewise on these integrals down here. And this all just stresses the importance of being slow and meticulous and setting things up so that you can double check your work because if I can make mistakes you can make mistakes also this is where when you're doing big hairy ugly integrals I'm doing this on the board for you so that you can see how it is done um, but I would advise that you double check your work with tools like maple or Mathematica all right so then here when I do this integral, I have a pi over 2 minus pi, so I get a negative sign here. This one goes to 0, so this isn't impacted at all. Um, and then here, sine, I have, I actually evaluated it incorrectly when I said it was 2, because um, I sort of knew what I kind of was expecting. And 
I was wrong. So here I have a 2 sine of pi over 2, which is 1, minus 2 sine of pi, which is 0. So I get 2 minus pi over 4. So this was the same way that your book did it, except that instead of defining, so your book went from here to here and defined theta as this angle, and I used the more typical um, way of expressing polar coordinates, and I just shifted my path. So I have path C. The answer is 2 minus pi over 4. And this is notable, you know, so here we have different answers depending on the path that we use. All right, so um, what we saw was that the path that we took changed, oh, I, oh, greatest sin a physicist can commit, I have forgotten my units. So here, this would have to have units of joules. We saw that the amount of work done, um, which is the change in the kinetic energy, depends on which path that it took. And then a, a few important notes. So the work is the work done by the total force, um, not each individual component. Um, and you could write, if you wanted to, you could write that the total work done is the sum over all forces. It sort of hurts my heart to not start at zero, but I'm trying to follow your book for the work done going from path one to two. Um, but what you're really, uh, the physical quantity is the total work done. I would also, I said a few seconds ago that you can check your work with a program like Maple or Mathematica, but neither of those would have caught the mistake I made because the mistake that I made was to set my integrals up incorrectly. Well, it was not actually doing the math, it was how I set them up. Uh, or there were a few mistakes doing the math, but um, it was mostly how I set them up. And your integral programs will not catch when you set the integral up incorrectly. And we're going to talk about a special subset of forces. Um, so in this particular case, the amount of energy, the change in kinetic energy, depended on the path that we took to get um, between two points. But there are forces where it doesn't depend on the path that you take. Um, no matter how you go between two points, the work done by the force is the same. These forces are called conservative forces because they conserve the amount of energy. Um, and we're going to talk about what those forces look like. There are they are a pretty significant fraction of there are some really important forces like gravity. You've already worked with gravity a lot, and you know, for instance, that gravity has a potential. So you can define the potential energy due to gravity. Um, and we're going to consider what it takes um, to be conservative. We'll, we'll, we'll just worry, assume we have only one force. Um, and what does it take to be conservative? So first of all, it has to only depend on, on position. So conservative forces only depend on R. Now, it can depend on each of the coordinates, but it only depends on the position. Um, and they have to, the work has to be the same between two paths. So work independent of path. So examples of conservative forces that you are familiar with already are elect the electrostatic force and gravity. Forces that you are somewhat familiar with that are non-conservative are, um, are air resistance and friction. Um, and if all forces are conservative, we can define the total mechanical energy. Um, so the total mechanical energy is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, which your book uses T for the kinetic energy and U for the potential energy. And if you have only conservative forces, this total mechanical energy is constant. Energy is conserved. And that gives us another tool in our toolkit, 
um, for solving problems. Now, as a practical matter, there are very frequently non-conservative forces around as well, even if you have some conservative forces, and mechanical energy is seldom strictly conserved. However, this is a pretty good approximation in many cases. So then, if we want to define a potential energy, we need to choose a reference point um, where the energy is zero. Now, does it really matter? You can set it arbitrarily. What matters is that you use a self-consistent definition. Um, so if within one problem, you can't change your zero in potential energy. Um, but if within the same, within one problem, you always choose the same reference, that's okay. Um, so potential energy is defined up to a constant. Um, so we are going to call the potential energy, which has to be as a function of position. It is the negative work. So we just had that the work done by the force is, uh, is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So if energy is constant, so we said energy equals T plus U, and we just said delta T equals the work. So now delta U has to equal negative the work. The change in energy has to equal zero if we have only mechanical forces, or sorry, only conservative forces. So here, then this is, the potential is the integral from position, from one position to the final, from our reference point to the final point we're looking at, F of R dot dr. And here I've put a prime to indicate that, uh, that this is just the integration variable. Um, and this is the work done if a, a particle moves from our reference point to the point of interest R. Um, and then we can talk about, uh, as an example, the potential energy of a charge in a uniform electric field. So this is example 4.2. Um, we have the electric force is given by Q E naught. Uh, let's actually we'll start by defining the electric field. The electric field is E naught E hat and the force is QE, so this is equal to QE naught E hat. From point one to point two, I'm going to put a circle around it to indicate that it is a point, not a value, of F dot dr, and uh, I put an r hat over this instinctively, but it's a dr, not a dr hat. And this is going to be, for this particular specific case, q e naught, and the integral from point one to two of x hat dot dr. So I am going to write our dr as x x hat plus y y hat plus z z hat. And our electric field is pointing only in the x hat direction. So here, uh, sorry, this should be a dx x hat dy y hat dz z hat um, dotted with x hat. So here I get dx, and my, the amount of work done is q e naught times the change in x position. So then, because my potential energy is equal to the negative work, 
That is, the, if the force does work on a particle, then the potential energy due to the force decreases by the amount of work done. So the potential is Q E naught delta X. Now you could choose to, uh, if, if, here you have to choose your reference point. So if you choose your reference point to be X equals zero, then your potential is negative QX, Q E naught times X. All right, so we have said that we can find a potential, uh, we can find a potential energy. So then if we want to know the potential to take something from one point, from point R zero to, to from the, our reference point to point two, we can write this as the work to move it from the reference point to point one, and then again to move it from point one to point two. And that means that we can write the work to move it from point one to point two as the work to move it from the reference point to point two minus the work to move it from the reference point to point one. Um, and this is the negative of the potential energy at point two minus the potential energy at point one. So this is the change, the negative of the change in the potential energy. Let me write that a little bit neater. So we get that the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the work to go from point from the reference point to point which are from point one to point two which is just the change in the potential energy so the change in if so we can get that delta the, so we get that the change in energy is equal to zero, or the energy plus the potential is a constant. In other words, the mechanical energy is conserved in the presence of, uh, of conservative forces. Well, if we only have conservative forces. So we can write our principle of energy conservation for a single particle. The energy, which is equal to the kinetic energy, plus the potential energy, which is equal to the kinetic energy, plus the sum of all of the potential energies from all of the forces. And we actually can use energy conservation uh, we can use a workaround to use energy conservation even in the presence of non-conservative for forces, where we say the change in, let me switch back to my favorite color, the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the work, which is equal to the work from conservative forces plus the work from non-conservative forces. And so then the change in the mechanical energy is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in the potential energy, which is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces. All right, so then we can go back to our old familiar uh, block sliding down an inclined plane. Uh, this problem is example 4.3.
and we can ask the question, what is the speed of the block when we get to the bottom? So um, we can use our same old, uh, I will breeze through it because we've done this problem at least three or four times in this set of videos. Um, so our normal force is N y hat, friction is, this is now sliding down the plane, um, the friction is mk times n in the negative x hat direction. The weight is mg sine theta x hat. Here I'm doing a quick check that when theta equals zero, my force should be equal to zero. And then this is in the positive, so it's in the positive x hat direction and it's negative in the y hat direction, so negative uh, cosine theta y hat. And do, 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 I can get that the net force is so here I get that the normal force is equal to the um, is equal to gravity so n equals mg cosine there sorry the normal force is whatever cancels out the y component so this is the magnitude of the normal force and this is the magnitude of friction is uh, well the friction is negative in the x direction so it's uh, the magnitude is mu sub k mg cosine theta, the net force is mg sine theta minus mu k mg cosine theta, and this is all in the x hat direction. Now here, um, we want to use conservation of energy because a good physicist is a lazy physicist, but uh, the non-conservative force makes that tricky. However, we can calculate the amount of work done um, by uh, using our, calculating the amount of work done by the non-conservative force. So we will use the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy is equal to the work done by friction. So um, we will, uh, you, we are going to consider the case when the initial block's velocity is zero, um, and so then our final potential energy is one half mv final squared. I'm going to drop the f subscript just because um, it's a lot of writing, a lot of extra terms. This height right here is then the, um, we are given the height in the problem is h, and this is, this is a length d, so we can solve to get h equals d sine theta, um, and then the change in potential energy is negative mg times the change in height. It goes down by a height d sine theta. And then the work done by friction slows the, um, it slows the block down. Um, so if you have no, um, so we want, we want this as high as, if, if you have no, um, no non-conservative forces, this side is zero, um, and you would find that the velocity is at, the velocity should be at its maximum. Um, here to get the, so the work done by friction, friction, so F dot dr is negative, so this is mu sub k mg, Uh, and then mg cosine theta times the distance traveled, which is d. 
Now, we have m's in every term. So I can divide through by m. And I can multiply through by 2 so that I get, I'm going to squeeze the 2 in there. I have uh, v squared. Then here, I'm going to add this term to both sides. So I'm going to move it over here equals 2gd sine theta minus gd mu sub k cosine theta. Or that the velocity is the square root of, uh, let's see, I dropped my 2 there, the square root of 2gd sine theta minus mu sub k cosine theta. All right, so then um, I would also note that we can get this. So this is how we solve this problem uh, using energy conservation. We can also get this with kinematic equations by taking this up here and noticing that, let me actually switch colors to highlight that we're doing something a little bit different. Um, so, the acceleration is g sine theta minus mu sub k g cosine theta. And then uh, you have the equation, uh, the velocity final squared equals the initial velocity squared plus 2 times the acceleration times the distance traveled. Now, in this case, this guy's 0. You get that the velocity squared equals 2 times the acceleration, g sine theta minus mu sub k, g cosine theta times the distance traveled, d. So you get the same answer whether you use kinematics or energy conservation, which is exactly as it should be because the laws of physics are independent of how you choose to solve the problem. Okay, so then we're going to talk about how you can tell if a force is conservative or how you can tell what a force is if you are given a potential. Um, so if we have, if we want to consider the work done by a force, which is going from R to R plus ah, dr, then, um, so this is equal to the force dr, the, the magnitude of the force dot product with dr. This is going to be equal to the x component dx plus the y component dy plus the z component dz. And this is going to be equal to the negative of the potential energy, which, uh, sorry, the negative of the change in potential energy, which is going to be equal to the negative of R plus the potential at R plus dr minus the potential at R. And this is all equal to the negative of u at x plus dx, y plus dy z plus dz minus the potential at x, y, z. And we can look at this and say that, so we can also take the, a small change in du, 
and say that the change in du is equal to the derivative of u with respect to x, dx, plus the derivative of u with respect to y, dy, plus the derivative with respect to u, dz, or sorry, with respect to z, dz. Um, and we can then compare that to this expression that we have right here. Uh, and there should be a big old, so then this is negative. So we can then write this as negative partial u partial x dx plus partial u partial y dy plus partial u partial z dz. Now, we can say, well, I'm allowed to arbitrarily fix any of these zeros, so let me fix dy and dz zero, and then we get that the x component of the force has to equal negative partial u partial x because they both have a coefficient of dx, and I can do something similar in the y direction, negative partial u partial y, and something similar in the z direction. And then I get that the force, this, if this looks familiar, this is the negative of something called the gradient of the potential energy u. So if we can find a potential, so if we have a force and we can find a potential for which that force is the negative gradient of the potential, then uh, our force is conservative. Conversely, if we have a potential and we want to know what force that potential has, we can take the negative gradient. And I want a little aside, so this is all in Cartesian coordinates, but physicists often work in other coordinate systems. Remember that this gradient operator is not the same in non-Cartesian, it doesn't have the same form in non-Cartesian coordinates. So if you are working in something other than Cartesian coordinates, the easiest thing to do is look up what? This operator is called del, how you write del in that other coordinate system. Um, and this all comes from the fact that when you take derivatives in, um, when you take derivatives, your unit vectors are no longer constant when you're not working in Cartesian coordinates. So you get all of these extra terms. All right, so then we're gonna do several examples. I will say when I was in your spot, when I was an undergraduate, I massively underestimated the significance of this. The fact that you can, there is an intimate relationship between the force and the potential energy for conservative forces. All right, so we can do example 4.4. You find you have a potential, u equals a x y squared plus b sine of a con of c z, where a b and c are constants, um, and now I want to take the negative gradient, our gradient operator is x hat partial partial x plus y hat partial partial y plus z hat partial partial z. So the force is equal to the negative gradient of the potential. So my, so partial u partial x, I have a negative sign, and then I get a negative a y squared. Ah, I, I keep putting hats on when ah, only unit vectors like wearing hats. a y squared x hat, and then minus partial partial y, the only term with a y in it is right here. 
So I have a negative a time, well, my derivative of y gives me a 2, and then I have a x y y hat. And then I have my derivative with respect to, so I have my z term. And the only thing with a z dependence is here. So I have b, I take the derivative with respect to z, and I get a constant sine cosine cz in the z hat direction. Okay, so uh, our first condition for a conservative force was that it had to only depend on the position. Um, if the force only depends on the position, then we can define the potential. Um, so that uh, this requirement is, um, is how we translate that requirement in words into an equation. Our second condition is that the work has to be independent of the path that you do. And that corresponds to saying that the, um, the curl of the force has to equal zero. Um, so here we're, it's where the curl, this is now the cross product of this operator with f. So the way that you would write that curl, it's ugly. It's del cross f is the determinant of x hat, y hat, z hat, the operator partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z, f, x, f, y, f, z, and if we write this all out in its ugly glory, we get partial f, z, partial y, minus partial f, y, partial z, x hat, minus partial partial x f z minus partial partial z f x y hat plus partial partial x you can hear me take a breath because it's a lot and if i get tired writing it down you probably get tired just looking at it all right, so this is our curl, and this thing has to be zero if we want to have a conservative force, and that puts some strict constraints on the behavior of this force F. So we're gonna do an example, and we're gonna do an example that is relevant to physics. We're gonna look at the, um, at the Coulomb force and ask the question if the Coulomb force is conservative. We are going to do this in spherical polar coordinates. And that is ugly. Um, actually, we can, we're going to do it in polar coordinates. It's still ugly. So we're going to start. So this is example 4.5. Our force is given by kqq over r squared. This is a constant, and this is the product of the two charges, r hat. And I can write this as my constants I will lump together and call gamma. And the reason it's useful to do that is because then it has the same form as gravity. And then r hat over r squared. But r hat is just r over r vector over r so this is gamma r over r cubed all right so then ah, we're actually we actually are going to do this in cartesian coordinates 
So this I can write, I'm going to write this as gamma x x hat over r cubed plus y y hat over r cubed plus z z hat over r cubed. And that makes this easier to do in Cartesian coordinates. And then we can look at just the x component of the curl which I'm going to denote like this, just the x component. This is partial fz partial y minus partial fy partial z. And so this is the partial derivative with respect to y of the z component z gamma z over r cubed minus partial partial z of the y component y over r cubed. Now here, let me do this out long for at least one of them, partial partial y of r is partial partial y of x squared plus y squared plus z squared square root. So this is just a chain rule and I get 1 over the square root of x squared. Well, I'm going to just write this with square roots. So this is this mess to the 1 half. So I get uh, 1 half x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the negative 1 half times 2y. But I can just write this as y divided by r. So I can similarly write, so I can write y partial r partial y equals y over r partial r partial z equals z over r. And I don't need it, but I can look, they all have the same pattern. The partial derivative of r with respect to x is then x over r. So then I come down here and I do partial, partial y of this thing, gamma z r cubed. This is equal to, now this doesn't depend on, the gamma and the z are independent of y, so I can just move them out, gamma z partial, so I now have partial, partial y of r to the negative 3. So this is gamma z times negative 3 r to the negative 4 y over r, which is equal to negative gamma z y r to the negative 5. Partial, partial z of, I dropped my gamma there, gamma y r to the third. I could use symmetry. But hey, I'm, gonna, I'm here to show you how to do it. Let me switch colors because I see that it's kind of hard to see on my shirt um, what all of these equations are. So this is my, when I take the derivative with respect to z, this stuff is constant. So the gamma y comes along for the ride. And then I have partial r, partial z. So I get a negative 3 r to the negative 4, 
and then partial r partial z is z over r. So I get negative 3 gamma z y r to the negative fifth. So I get the same thing. So when I take the difference, I get 0. Now, all of the x and y terms happen to have the exact same form. So I only considered the x form here, but I could do the same thing for the y form. And I would, in fact, see that all of them are 0. So we can use a symmetry argument and say that all of the other terms are 0. Remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. We use symmetry, and we show that, uh, that these are 0. We also could have used spherical polar coordinates in order to get the curl, and it would show us the same thing. And for your edification, I am going to do that um, because that's the reason we're here. We're here for your edification. So I am going to take the back of the book and look up the spherical polar coordinate uh, form of the curl, and I get r hat over r sine theta partial partial theta of sine theta a phi minus partial partial phi a theta plus theta hat 1 over r sine theta partial partial phi a r minus 1 over r partial partial r of r a phi plus phi hat over r partial partial r of r a theta minus partial partial theta a r. All right, so that took the hardest part about this approach is writing that down. Um, because now we can look at our form here and use, so rewrite it as F equals gamma R to the negative 2 R hat. We only have an R hat component. So all of the terms that do not, the A phi and A theta terms, are all zero. And then the derivative of the radial component with respect to the angle is zero. And the derivative of the radial component with respect to the angle theta is also zero. So our curl is zero. Now I want to point out here, this is using physicist coordinates. So uh, the angle phi is in the xy plane, and the angle theta is the angle down from the z-axis. This differs somewhat from the way that mathematicians typically describe their coordinates, where they flip them, where they use theta in the xy plane, and phi is the angle down from the z-axis. It really is an arbitrary distinction. But it does mean that when you switch back and forth between math and physics textbooks, or really between any two textbooks, you have to be extremely careful to make sure that you are using the same definition of variables that the textbook uses. All right, so now we're going to try to define what that potential is, because if, the, if a force is conservative, what is its potential? Um, the potential energy is equal to the negative of f dot dr. So we are going to go from our, we're going to do this integral. We're going to go from our reference point to our test point. Um, we have uh, f here in spherical polar coordinates. 
we are going to choose dr as dr r hat. So we're going to be coming in radially from some point uh, further away and coming in closer. And then we get negative r0 to r. These are now scalars because we are looking um, in the, we're using spherical polar coordinates. We have chosen, so, so when we do our dot product, uh, this is gamma r to the negative 2. The r hats, r dot r hat is 1, and we are left with dr. Um, and this is equal to negative gamma, or sorry, let's see, gamma, positive gamma, r to the negative 1, evaluated at r naught and r. And here for clarity, I'm going to change these guys to r primes. So they're my integration dummy variable. Um, and this becomes gamma over r minus gamma over r naught. Typically, by convention, we choose um, we choose r equals infinity. Mathematicians hate this. We choose r0 equal to infinity. So this term goes to 0. And we are left with gamma over r, um, which for our Coulomb force means that the potential is k q1 q2 over r. And this should look familiar from your introductory class. Now we're going to consider what happens if you were to allow a time-dependent potential energy. Um, so in what we're going to see is that in this case, the potential energy, the total mechanical energy is not conserved. Um, we can have cases like that where you still may want, you may have a conservative force fundamentally, but uh, there's something else going on in the system, like you have a, an arrangement of charges and the charge is slowly moving because the system is not perfect. You're getting charge leaking away, and then you will see that the potential has time depend some time dependence. So we're going to start by looking at a small change in our kinetic energy. And assume this has a time dependence. We can write this as, so this is d dt of 1 half m v dot v dt. And we can rewrite this as m v dot dot v. And this has to equal the work that is done, f dot dr. A small change in the potential energy is partial partial x of u dx plus partial partial y of u dy. I think I've worn out the marker today. plus partial partial z of u dz. And then now we are allowing a time dependence. So partial partial t of u dt. And so this is equal to negative f dot dr plus the time dependence of the potential. So du dt is then, or sorry, that d of t plus u equals d capital T plus du. These terms cancel out. And we are left with partial u, partial t, dt.
So mechanical energy is only conserved when this term is zero. If there is any time dependence to the potential, you no longer have um, mechanical conservation of mechanical energy. When this happens, you usually have something else. So some, some of the energy is being transported to other types of energy because you still have global energy conservation. You just may not have mechanical energy conservation. So then we can consider uh, one-dimensional systems in more detail. And a reason why we're going to consider one-dimensional systems, they're really simple. Um, so we can look at, we can visualize things in a way that we can't do when we're considering four three-dimensional si systems um, because we can plot the, the energy on one axis and the position on another. Um, I can't draw four-dimensional graphs. I can hardly grab, draw two-dimensional graphs. Um, and also, a lot of problems can be converted into a one-dimensional uh, into a one-dimensional problem because we have either motion constrained in one dimension, or uh, or the net force in in some directions is zero. Okay, so one-dimensional does not have to mean straight. We often are looking at problems that are very simple and where everything is straight, um, but it doesn't have to be. If we look in one dimension, we are talking about the work from moving from x1 to x2. I'll default to calling it x, but there's nothing special about x. If you were considering radial motion, you could call the angle theta. Um, you, could call the, you could call the variable bob. I don't care what you call your variables. All right, so then we are, the work done is f of, the integral of f of x dx, when you have a one-dimensional problem. Um, for a conservative force, this has to be a, a function of f only. And um, it has to be, uh, it has to be independent of the path that you use to get there. Um, and we can, uh, we can look specifically for conservative forces. Um, for conservative forces, the potential energy is the negative integral from x reference point to your final x position of the x component of the force with respect to dx. Um, and we can take the force of a spring, F equals negative kx, where here we're defining the origin to be the equilibrium position. The potential of, the potential energy is the integral, the negative signs cancel out, of kx from, we'll set x equals x naught to, to be 0 to x and dx. So we get that the potential energy is 1 half kx squared. And this should look very familiar. Um, and we can then take for a variety of forces. We plot the potential here. And this is the x position. We can plot what goes on with them and draw the potential energy as a function of x. And we can start talking about what behaviors we see. Um, so when we are here, we can draw our force. So force is negative partial, negative of the derivative. So the derivative here is um, the derivative here is positive, so the force here is negative. The derivative here is negative, so the force is positive. So this is showing what the force does. Um, when you're here, the derivative here is positive, so the force is negative. The derivative here is negative, so the force is positive. The force here is zero because we are at an inflection point. The derivative is zero. When you're just on this side, the, the, the force is positive, so the derivative is negative. When you're here, the force is negative, so the derivative is positive. Here, likewise. So what you can see here is the type of behavior. Um, you, already, you probably already know this from an introductory class, 
But when you, so when you're here, when your potential is at a minimum, and it on, only a local minimum, then the force is always pushing you back towards the equilibrium point. When you are here at an unstable equilibrium point, if you're just slightly off, the force is kicking you off of that equilibrium point. Um, so you can visualize this and think about it as something like a roller coaster track or a height. Um, when I'm thinking about potential energies, I often imagine a topological map because a topological map is giving you the potential as a function of the position in X. And then when we have this one-dimensional system, we can actually use conservation of energy to get a differential equation that, if solvable, gives us a complete solution. Um, so we know what this does as a function of all time. So we have one-half mv squared, which I will write as mvx dot squared, equals the total energy minus the potential energy, which is only a function of x. So I can then multiply by 2 over m on both sides. And I get x dot squared equals 2me minus 2m times the potential as a function of x, or take the square root, and I get this equation right here. This is dx dt, and since this is a function of x, we're going to move this on this side, and we get dx over 2me minus 2mu square root, equals d t, integrate both sides, and you get t final minus t initial equals the, in, oh, and I, when I took the square root here, I should have a plus or minus, equals plus or minus dx over 2me minus 2mu square root. So, this equation is in general, if this equation is solvable, this is going to give you a solution for all, um, all time. And we can then look at a specific example of a stone in free fall. This is example 4.6. Our potential energy, we're dropping it, we're going to choose our, ordin our coordinate system to have x along this axis, and the stone starts at x equals 0. So our potential is negative mgx. And then we can write this. Our, we drop the stone, so our initial um, kinetic energy is equal to 0. So uh, our, and our, sorry, and our initial total energy is equal to zero because we have set our potential energy to zero at the origin, at the starting point. So then 2me minus 2m times the potential I have a stupid math mistake here. I meant to, this needed to have a division by m. And I didn't catch myself. I'm going to put the square root of m here. And here. And this is why you should always check units so that you don't do dumb things like I just did. Okay, so then 2e over m minus 2u over m. This term goes to 0. 
and this is just a positive 2gx. So then here, I am just integrating this thing right here, goes on the bottom, and I have to take the square root. So I need the integral with respect to x of to the square root of 2g, 1 over the square root of 2gx. And I'm going to integrate from 0 to x. So I start at x equals 0. And um, this is equal to, I will choose my t initial equals 0. So this is t equals dx over the square root of 2gx. This is... 1 over the square root of 2g, x to the negative 1 half, integral dx, 0 to x. This is 1 over the square root of 2g, x to the 1 half, times 2, and then I evaluate it from 0 to x, and this gives me the square root of 2 over g, x to the 1 half, x to the 1 half. And I can square both sides, t equals 2x, t squared equals 2x over g, or x equals 1 half g t squared. This is just our old friend from, the kinem from looking at problems kinematically. All right, so then we can consider some cases. Um, we'll do some really gnarly examples um, where you have a one-dimensional system such as a roller coaster or a... Uh, um, bead con confined to run along a wire. Um, and here uh, you have, uh, you can say that the kinetic energy is one half m s dot squared. So it's just the motion along this path. Um, there is a normal force, but the normal force does not do any work because it is always perpendicular to the path. So if you have a roller coaster traveling along this direction, the, there is a normal force, but it's always perpendicular to the path. It's keeping the roller coaster on. It's very important. But when you're considering conservation of, when you're considering the trajectory, assuming conservation of energy, it doesn't turn out to change the trajectory. Um, and in this case, your um, tangential force, which we will call F tang, is equal to ms double dot. Um, if all forces are conservative, then this is then further equal to negative du ds, whatever s is. And then you can use that the energy the mechanical energy is constant, and use that to solve your problem. Okay, so now we are going to apply what we have learned to a somewhat esoteric example. This is, uh, this is example 4.7, um, which is figure four, and I've redrawn figure 4.14. So this seems really esoteric, and why, when are you ever going to come up with a situation like this? But I want the point of this example is to show you that you can solve even kind of confusing, even pretty confusing problems. Um, and actually, when you go out and apply your physics knowledge outside of the classroom, you're going to find that almost all problems are complicated and confusing. But you still can take the things that you have learned, you know little pieces, start breaking the problem into pieces, and you can solve it. You can figure out what the answer is. Okay, so 
here we have a cylinder fixed on the axis. We have chosen, following what the book did, to put the origin of the coordinate system at the center of that axis. So this is totally, so this is fixed. It can, um, the, the block can roll, but the, uh, the cylinder is fixed. And you've got a square, which is, has length 2b by 2b, um, to lowercase b. Um, and the block can roll like this back and forth on the cylinder. Um, there are uh, some constraining forces. There's the normal force and friction. So the normal force is going to act in this direction. Um, but because the, uh, the object is rotating, the normal force does no work um, because the direction of the motion is always going to be, um, is always going to be perpendicular to the, the normal force. The box is moving, is wobbling like this. Um, so we don't need to consider the normal force and friction when we're writing up our energy. Um, the only thing we have to consider is gravitational potential energy and the, um, and the kinetic energy. So now we can write our potential energy. And this one is a little bit tricky. Okay, so the potential energy, given that we have set, so we've set the origin here so that the potential is zero if the block were all the way down. And then we want, uh, this is a height, this block has a mass m. We need to figure out this height h. This is the angle theta. So this much of the height, we have mg times the height. And that is mg and then r plus b cosine theta. And that is going to get us, um, that is going to get us this far. And then we have to figure out how much this, uh, this height is. So when the block is initially positioned, the center of mass of the two, um, I have not drawn a great drawing here, but the center of mass of the two blocks is exactly above each other. So then you can ask, well, how much does, uh, does this, we have to figure out this extra little chunk of height. Um, we have to, and then we have, this is what we start with. This is theta. This is a 90 degree angle right here. So this two is theta. So if we can figure out this length, which is the difference between the center of mass and the line from the center, then uh, we just need to, we need that line, that hypotenuse times sine theta. So the question is, what is this length? That length is the amount the block has rotated as it goes from here to here. Well, that arc, that is the arc length going from theta equals zero to the final theta. And that arc length is r times theta. So here, this is, we, this is our full potential energy. And the problem asks us to examine the stability. Um, is this stable and how can we tell? Um, so we, we're just going to look here to see if we um, are at a minimum or a max. Are there any minima in the energy? So uh, here, we're going to try to, this is, note that this is now a one-dimensional problem, even though 
this is describing a three-dimensional problem, there is one variable that describes all of the motion, and that's theta. So we've taken this complicated problem and we have made it into a one-dimensional problem. And now we want to ask, so we could, we are after understanding basically what the plot of u versus theta does. Does it have any minima? Um, it, does it have, um, if it has any minima, are they stable or unstable? So we want to take derivatives with respect to theta. Um, the equilibrium position is going to be where du d theta equals zero. So we can take this derivative, the mg just comes along for the ride, r plus b and then negative sine theta. This is a product rule, so we have r sine theta plus r theta cosine theta. And now we have an r sine, a negative r sine theta and a positive r sine theta, so we can make some cancellations. This term cancels out that term. So we are left with mg r theta cosine theta minus b sine theta. Now, we can, if we want to solve when this is equal to zero, when theta equals zero, sine theta equals zero. So there is one equilibrium point um, at theta equals zero. We will have other equilibrium points where r theta cosine theta equals b sine theta or tan theta equals r over b theta. Um, now, this is not solvable analytically, um, but what we can do is, um, what we can tell that if r over b is greater than 1, there are additional stable points, so that's at least some information because there will be more solutions if r over b is greater, or there can be more solutions if r over b is greater than 1. Um, the main one the book talks about is this guy, theta equals 0. Now to figure out if it's stable, we can take the second derivative. If these solutions are stable, we can take the second derivative. And we get m g r cosine theta plus ah, minus r theta sine theta minus b cosine theta. And then the question here is if it is greater than or less than, um, if it is greater than or less than 1. Now, this is really easy for so we want to know if it is greater than 1, because if it is greater than, if this derivative is greater than 1, then our equilibrium point is stable. Um, if it is less than 1, then the equilibrium point is unstable. When we specifically evaluate this at theta equals 0, we get mg r minus b. So this equilibrium point is stable if r is 
greater than b. So if the radius of this is greater than the, um, the side of the square, um, in that case, the, the square will sit stably. We can see if we can tell about other equilibrium points, and we might not be able to. Again, I'm flying without a net here. So here we can use, for the other solutions, we have that sine theta equals r over b theta cosine theta, and plug that in to eliminate the sine, th the cosine theta, or the, sorry, eliminate the sine theta, and we get r cosine theta minus r theta, replace sine theta by this, so I get an r squared over b theta squared cosine theta minus b cosine theta, and this is m g, let me, I'm going to pull out the cosine theta, and I am left with, I'm actually going to pull out a b as well, So I am left with r over b minus r over b squared theta squared, or sorry, r squared over b squared theta squared minus 1. So then if we look at this expression, again, we are dependent, so this is only going to these solutions only exist for r over b greater than 1. So uh, here, if r over b is 1, then if it's exactly 1, then this term cancels that term, and this becomes negative. If it's greater than 1, r over b quantity squared is always going to be um, this number is always going to be larger than that number, but it's a little bit weighted by, so there's a theta squared. So if theta is less than 1, then you could end up with, but it's got to be a very small number, you could end up with, uh, eh, you'd have to have it cancel out this and that's rather tight. So it would depend numerically on what exact angles those are, but it looks like they would not be stable. And then we can consider more um, general examples. So it, it's in a lot of cases, the constraints do no actual work. So when you're using energy conservation, you don't need to consider forces that do no work. Um, here is an example. This is figure five, uh, or sorry, figure 4.15, um, and this shows an Atwood machine. Fun fact, an Atwood machine doesn't do anything except exhibit tensions get redirected by pulleys. Um, it, it's not actually a functional thing other than teaching physics, but in this case, we assume that the pulley is massless, so the, um, the string is redirecting the um, the tension, but the tension, the magnitude of the tension is the same side on this side and on this side. Um, in, on, for this mass, there is the weight due to gravity and the force due to tension. On this side, there is the weight due to gravity and the force due to tension. They have the same magnitude. I put a prime there because they're acting in different directions. We can then write a conservation of energy equation for each side. The, tain, the change in the kinetic energy for mass 1 plus the change in the kinetic energy for or potential energy for mass 1 has to equal the work done by the tension which is equal here we'll we'll use the variable as defined in the book 
x. So x is the distance down. So let's assume that the, um, so let's assume mass one is falling and then uh, the force of tension dotted with the um, change in direction is going to be negative times the magnitude of the force of the tension, delta x. And we can write something similar for the second mass, the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy for the second mass is equal to the force of tension done on the, sorry, the work done by tension on mass two. So in this case, when mass one is falling, mass two is rising. So then F dot dx for mass two is positive and is equal to the force of tension times delta x. Um, so then this tells us, because we figured out numerically what it is, that the sum of these forces is zero. We can, also, we can add this together, and that gives us the total energy um, conservation in the system. So this says that the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy is equal to zero, or that the, energy, the total energy is constant. So the Atwood machine is in fact useful for something, it's useful for teaching physics. We're now going to talk a little bit about central forces, and central forces are very important in physics because two of our uh, fundamental forces are central. The um, good, so gravity is central. Actually, gravity is central, and the electromagnetic force is central, um, and really the strong force is central. But we just don't have a closed form to describe it. Um, the electroweak force is central. The fundamental forces are central. So uh, so even though we talk about forces that are not central, a lot of them are. Um, so it's useful to think about them specifically. And when we say a central force, what we mean is that the force as a function of the position is just some function of the position times r hat, that it is only in the radial direction when you're talking about the force between two different objects. It then has to be, the force must be along, directed along the line between them. So, it can be attractive or repulsive, but it has to be along that direction. Um, so one example is the uh, electrostatic force, KQQ over R squared, R hat. Um, so central forces we're, we're going to talk about, they are, they are all conservative. No energy is lost in them, um, and they are all spherically symmetric. So if you have a force acting in this, so it's always in the r hat direction, um, it's got to be along the path between them. So if you move the object that they're interacting with, you're not sensitive to angles. It doesn't change depending on which angle you have relative to the object. And they are then rotationally invariant. Um, so if you have a central force, it is which is radially symmetric, it is conservative, and vice versa. Um, that means that we really have to suck it up and deal with spherical polar coordinates. So when we, now here's where you're going to see the mirror image uh, of what I draw. So be careful. Let's see, I will 
I don't think that I can draw the non-mirror image. So, all right, so we will just keep in mind that this, I am drawing a right-handed coordinate system, which means that if I use my actual right hand, X cross Y gives me Z, um, but you guys will see it as, you guys perceive this to be my right hand. So you will see this as a left-handed coordinate system. You think this is my right hand, X cross Y is negative Z. I can't draw very well in the mirror image, so I'm just gonna stick with this and keep in mind that you want to use a right-handed coordinate system in physics. All right, so if we're talking about an object at point P, then we can draw, we are gonna describe the position with three coordinates, R, which is the distance from the origin. We're going to take the projection of our vector r onto the xy plane and then you can draw a you can draw a line from the origin to that point where the projection hits in the xy plane and this angle with the x axis is phi and then you can take the projection of the vector r onto the z-axis and the angle that the vector r makes with the z-axis is called theta. And these are our spherical polar coordinates. We can then write the, x, the coordinates x, y, and z in spherical polar coordinates in terms of r, phi, and theta. And just a second. You can always go back and forth, and sometimes it's going to be a little bit easier. Work in, sometimes it can help you see how uh, how to work in spherical polar coordinates if you remember the Cartesian coordinate versions. All right, so we are going to come up with expressions for x, y, and z in spherical polar coordinates. This, is, this has a length r, so when we take the projection onto the x, y plane, that projection as a length r sine theta, whereas the projection onto the z-axis has a length r cosine theta. Then we're going to project this vector onto the x-axis, and when we do that, we get the length of this hypotenuse, the, the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle, which is r sine theta, times cosine phi. And then we do the same thing on to the y-axis. We have the length of the hypotenuse of that triangle, r sine theta, sine phi. So, if phi is equal to zero, I am entirely along the x-axis. Um, if phi is equal to pi over two, I'm entirely on the y-axis. Then, if theta equals zero, the angle with the z-axis is zero, everything is along the z-axis. If theta is equal to pi over two, everything is in the xy plane. So we can read off from this that the magnitude of z is r cosine theta. The magnitude of x is r sine theta cosine phi. The magnitude of y is r sine theta 
sine 5. And then we can just double check. We should get x squared plus y squared equals r squared. x squared, or sorry, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals y squared. So this gives us an r, the x squared plus y squared gives us r squared sine squared theta cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi. And then I add my z squared, r squared, cosine squared, theta. Now, this is just equal to 1. So here I have r squared, sine squared, theta, plus r squared, cosine squared, theta. And indeed, this is equal to r squared. Now, unit vectors are a little tricky, so we're going to have unit vectors in the, we're going to have unit vectors r hat, theta hat, and phi hat. Um, and by convention, our unit vectors always, uh, our unit vectors are always positive in the direction of increasing variable. So, I have r hat is in this direction. Phi hat is in the xy plane. I'm going to draw them in different places just so that it is easier to see. So phi hat is in the xy plane, and because it's always increasing phi, and theta hat is right here. It is increasing theta. So phi hat is pointing towards u. Um, theta hat and r hat are in this direction. All right. So then, we can look at a, we have a function, actually I didn't mean to erase those, I want to keep them up here, keep in mind that your math textbooks are probably going to switch the definitions of theta and phi for inexplicable reasons. Now it's an arbitrary choice what you call theta and what you call phi, but for inexplicable reasons, physicists and mathematicians made different decisions. Maybe that's just to be difficult, because we're all known for our difficulty. So then, if we want to look at a small change in f, moving along some, dis some for instance, the radial force, we want to take the gradient of f dotted with v, r, d, r is just r hat d, r plus theta hat r d theta plus phi hat r sine theta d phi, oh sorry, phi hat r, r sine theta d phi. So this is saying if you move in some direction, if you're moving in the phi hat direction, then this is the arc length in that direction d phi, whereas for the theta direction, your arc length is just r d theta. Okay, so then the F is partial F partial R D R and then uh, let's see, I need my 
that the small change in f is partial f partial r dr plus partial f partial theta d theta plus partial f partial phi d phi. And this is just because all functions, if you write a small change in the function, it is the change in each variable, the deri partial derivative with respect to each variable times the small change in that variable. Um, and then this has to equal whatever the gradient of f is in the r direction, dr, plus whatever the gradient of f is in the theta direction, d theta, plus whatever the gradient is of f is in the phi direction, d phi. And this has to equal, um, so here, this has to equal this thing, the components of this thing. So here we can read off partial f partial r equals the radial component of, we can, ah, yes, here, this has to be the radial component. I've dropped my extra factors here. The radial component of theta, um, r, d, theta, plus the, radi or the radial, the theta component of the gradient times r d theta plus the phi component of the gradient times r sine, phi, sine theta d phi. All right, so then by comparing this expression and this expression, we can see that the radial component of the gradient of r is just equal to partial f, so partial f partial r, so I can put an r hat here. The theta component is partial f partial theta, 1 over r, because this term has to equal that term. And then the phi component is 1 over r sine theta partial f partial phi. And when we do that, del dot r hat is going to give us this expression. So partial f partial r dr. And here we have r d theta divided by r partial f partial theta gives us partial f partial theta d theta. 1 over r sine theta partial f partial r times r sine theta d phi gives us partial f partial phi d phi. So our, when we use the gradient in spherical polar coordinates, we get this big, ugly, gnarly, nasty mess. And I'm not going to do del squared. You can look it up in the back of your book. Um, you can do del squared by doing del dot del f. And then when you have, have you're going to use del in radial, so your del in spherical polar coordinates, which is an operator, is r hat partial partial r plus theta hat 1 over r partial f partial, or sorry, partial partial theta plus 1 over r sine theta partial partial phi, and I need my
theta hat. And this just gets ugly, and when, you, when these derivatives move through the, the angles, they also take derivatives of that. So it's hairy and ugly, and you can look it up in the back of your book. But we are going to use spherical polar coordinates in this class because a lot of physics problems really are a thousand times easier in spherical polar coordinates. So a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Choose spherical polar coordinates when they make it less work for you and look things up rather than rederive them. Okay, so now we're going to return. Here I've just noted some things about spherical polar coordinates, and we're going to return to our potential. So we're going to assume that our potential is only a function of the position, um, and specifically that it is only a position of the distance between two objects. We can then take our expression for the gradient in spherical polar coordinates and look at the force, because the force is the negative of the gradient of the potential, which we are assuming is of this form. So when we move through, there's no derivative. We, we let our del operator act on u. There's no dependence on phi. There's no dependence on theta. So there are then no theta or phi components. And the force is simply partial u, negative partial u, partial r in the r hat direction. So as soon as we have depended, have assumed that the force only depends on the distance between two objects, it has to only be a radial force. And if it is a radial force, it is then radially symmetric. It doesn't depend on, um, it doesn't depend on the angle at all. Um, you only have a radial component. So that's actually a rather deep, um, a rather deep result. We can then look carefully at the energy between two interacting particles. Um, we're going to stick in spherical polar coordinates because a good physicist is a lazy physicist. And we will take the, um, so the force, so we've got two particles, the force of one acting on object one acting on, acting on object two has to equal is a function in principle of R1 and R2. And it also has to equal the negative of the force acting on, of 2 acting on 1. So here we can use as an example gravity. Gravity is negative G M1 M2 over R. 1, 2 squared, the distance between them, r hat, and then r hat we can write as r1, let me stick with the note, yeah, r1 minus r2 over the magnitude of this. where I have called this thing R12, and then we can replace this by negative G M1 M2 R12 cubed r1 minus r2. So then we see that we have a function which really not only does it depend on the distance, it only depends on the dis difference between these two vectors. Um, and we can further say any isolated system, so I've got two particles, it has to be translationally invariant. It can't depend on how I define my origin. Um, the, uh, so 
my definition of the origin is completely and totally arbitrary. Um, so it cannot depend on where I define my origin. And that is consistent with this, um, that it's the difference between the two vectors. The, the force only depends on uh, the distance between two vectors. Now, um, we will often choose to put particle two at the origin because that makes one of these vectors zero and that makes a lot of the math a lot easier than instead of writing R12, we can just put R um, because we have defined the position of R1 to the difference between R1 and R2 to be, the, um, to be just the position. And we can look further at these spherical polar um, coordinates and go back to our old definition. You know, how do we know if a force is conservative? The force is conservative if um, we have, we can use that del cross F has to equal zero, but this corresponds because we have a potential defined to del cross the gradient of u being equal to zero. So now we can go to um, the back of the book and we can look at what this operator is in spherical polar coordinates and see what that tells us about our functions. Okay, so we're going to start with del cross u. We had u of r only. So del of u is equal to r hat partial u partial r. And then we only have Using the back of the book, we only have uh, um, we only have an a sub r. So the book lists del cross a in spherical polar coordinates. is a big, ugly mess, it's a phi. And this is why what you should do is not rederive. I love rederiving things. I don't like memorizing things, but this is the perfect time to simply use the back of the book. The odds of making a mistake when rederiving something like this are simply too high. And you can see here that you get all sorts of complicated terms. Ah, oh, I dropped my, I need to have my one over R. So here I can use the fact that A theta is zero, as is a phi, and that means that this term is zero, and this term is zero, and this term is zero, and this term is zero, simply because there's no, uh, there is no theta term there, and now we have a r, the derivative with respect to phi, and the derivative with respect to theta, those are both zero um, because there is no 
phi or theta dependence. So this has to be zero as soon as we have a radial force. And in fact, you could instead start by, so you have a radial force and allow there to be some theta and phi dependence, but you only have a radial component. Um, and then you would see that, you know, you cannot have you cannot have a theta or phi dependence and still have del cross f equal, um, equal to zero. So to have a conservative force, you cannot have a radial or phi dependence. That is left as an exercise for the student, which means that that's a lot of hairy, ugly algebra. Um, so this means that there is a single potential energy for both particles, descri describing the system of both particles. We can then circle back to uh, our collisions between two particles and talk about, we can talk about collisions again um, using energy conservation, conservation, which I actually did sneak into the last discussion of uh, elastic collisions when we talked about momentum conservation, but, um, but we hadn't reviewed energy conservation. We are going to start with a spe special case, example 4.8. We have a collision between two particles of equal mass. Um, and we are going to start with one of them at rest. So V2 is initially, at, uh, particle two is initially at rest. Particle one has some momentum. So we can write momentum conservation like this, that they have the same mass, so the masses cancel out. V1 equals V1 prime plus V2 prime. Prime indicates that this is the final momentum. And we then have energy conservation, one half M V1 squared equals one half M V1 prime squared plus one half M V2 prime squared our m's and I, I can divide, I can multiply, oh, I want a different color. I can multiply by two over m so that I didn't need the subscript, so that my m's and my twos cancel out. And I am left with v1 squared plus v1 prime squared plus v2 prime or sorry, equals v1 squared prime plus v2 squared prime. All right, this is still our energy conservation equation. And then here I have, I'm going to square this. So v1 dot v1 equals v1 prime plus v2 prime dotted with V1 prime plus V2 prime. So I get V1 squared equals V1 prime squared plus V2 prime squared plus 2 v2 prime dotted with v1 prime. And this is from our momentum conservation. So then I can take, I'm gonna subtract off energy conservation. And I am left with 0 equals 2 v2 prime dot v1 prime. So I get that this dot product has to equal 0. That means that the final momenta of the initial and final objects has to be perpendicular. So that's actually a kind of interesting result. Um, because all I assumed is that I had 
two initial masses, and that they were two masses that were two masses colliding. They have the same mass, and one of them starts at rest. Then they have to go off, and they're they're perpendicular. That's kind of cool. So now we're going to extend our discussion to. So we considered two particles. We're going to extend our discussion to multiple particles. We're going to start with four particles and then generalize this to more than four. We're going to start, start with four because it's easier to write uh, equations for four particles than infinite, and it'll be a little bit more obvious uh, when, we ex when we generalize. So for four particles, ooh, I don't need to write four twice, we have the kinetic energy equals the kinetic energy, oh, the sum of the kinetic energies, of all of the particles, um, where each one is one half m alpha, each particle alpha, the alpha particle, has a kinetic energy one half m alpha v alpha squared. The forces between the particles are conservative. We're going to only consider the cases where the forces are conservative. That's a good deal of cases. In that case, the particle, the force between the particles is just a function of the distance between the two particles. So we've taken particle pair three and four and considered that alone. So the force of three on four is negative. The gradient of the potential with respect to the position of particle three, the potential of, or sorry, the, part of, the force of particle four on particle three is the negative gradient with respect to the position of particle three of the potential between three and four. And you can write something similar, switching the indices. Now, when we consider all possible pairs of particles, um, there are so there are six pairs of particles here. Um, we have one, two, one, three, one, four, two, three, and two, four, and three, four. So there's six total combinations. You will see that if you think it through, and the total number of combinations is n minus, for n particles is n minus one, um, there are going to be pairs of external forces. So this force, and you're considering the total force on the system, this force cancels out that force. There's always pairs of forces that cancel out. Um, so the external force on alpha Is, so we're going to only consider cases where the external force on alpha is also conservative it, or it depends only on the position of alpha. So we can write, if we, we can write the internal energy, or sorry, the potential energy as the sum over alpha less than beta u alpha Theta plus the sum of external forces. So this is internal forces, and this is external forces. Um, and then if we have no external forces, then the kinetic energy, so we have a closed system, the change in energy has to equal the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy, which has to equal zero. We can generalize this to n particles. And the total kinetic energy is one half times the sum over all alpha 
m alpha v alpha squared and the potential energy the, this is actually the potential energy is the sum over alpha the potential beta greater than alpha the potential energies between the two of them you have this condition so that you don't double count and then the sum of the potential energies due to external forces. So this is the potential due to interactions between them, and this is the potential due to external forces. We can then consider what happens when you have a rigid body. In the case of a rigid body, what rigid means is that the positions between different parts of the body are um, are fixed. So when you look at this term, this has to be, the potential between different objects has to be dependent on the distance between the two particles because we're only considering conservative forces. And this is a constant which means that the total internal energy and internal potential energy is in fact a constant itself. And we're going to look at this and consider example 4.9, but I'm just going to clean up the board. And here we have a cylinder rolling down an incline. And actually, um, the incline does not have, we're using energy conservation, so the incline does not have to be flat and straight. It can be some funky shape here. We start it. Um, we start it at rest, and we can. First of all, our um, external potential, our potential energy from external forces. We're going to set our um, origin here. So this is going to be x, and this is going to be y. Um, and then our potential is the mass of the cylinder. I'm going to draw the cylinder here. So here we've got our cylinder. It's the mass of the cylinder times g times the initial y position. And then the kinetic energy of the cylinder is equal to the mass of one half m times the mass of the center of one half times the mass of the cylinder times the velocity of the center of mass plus one half times the moment of inertia times omega squared. We're given that it is rolling without slipping. The moment of inertia for a uniform cylinder um, is one half m times the radius squared. And if it is rolling without slipping, the velocity is equal to omega over r, uh, omega times r. So here, we can write, and so this would be the velocity of the center of mass equals the omega about the center of mass times r. So we get 1 half m v center of mass squared plus 1 half times 1 half m r squared times v center of mass squared over r squared. And then we can do quite a few simplifications. R, R, this is one quarter. So we have one half mv center of mass squared plus one quarter mv center of mass squared. So the kinetic energy is equal to three quarters. mass times the velocity of the center of mass squared. And we can figure out, so if it initially starts at rest and 
it ends at the bottom. This is equal to m g y masses cancel out. The velocity of the center of mass at the bottom is equal to four thirds, the square root of four thirds g y. So then we can see that we can use conservation of energy to solve even rather complicated problems.